My name is Andy Kudluck. I've been living politics most of my life, and at an early age, I started to learn from my uncles and my grandfather how to survive out in the land and in the summer and even in the winter time and during uh, blizzard conditions. How we uh, how we follow the moon, the sun, and the stars. Yes, there was a situation that might have been, I've been with the Rangers for quite a while now, maybe over 30 years, and um, it, this happened on my first, could have been my first or second search and rescue in politics. Um, in them days, in the early 90s, there's not much phone, so you go to the people, to visit, ask where you're going to go and, you know, certain what time you'll be back. So there was a hunter and with his uh, son, his son was five years, four to five years old. And I kept kept an eye on him. I knew where he was going out in the flat, so um, his name was George Krangnuk-Duck and his, he brought his uh, little son uh, figures he was five years old, and he was learning him how to his ways of how to survive and hunt caribou at the same time. So during that day, he made it back home here. I think it, the sled uh, his son was on was bonding so much, it must have made him drop off the sled as he was coming back to Politic. And so he made it home when he looked. At his sled, he was wondering, where's his boy? So he figured he must have dropped him a little ways or somewhere. And during that, as soon as the RCMP heard about it, we, the rangers all got together and put on a search and rescue, got everybody the gas and the snow machine oil, and everybody um, wasn't, they all got together in a muster point where everybody was going to get the direction where he went and they all set out. But at the same time that night, I was the last ranger. I didn't have enough gas to go on the trip. So they gave a certain amount of gas to all the people that's on the search and rescue. And I knew I knew somebody that had extra five gallons, so I borrowed that. And I went out. It, it was about 11, after 11 at night, and I was driving real slow. I filled up my tea for the, if I happened to find that little boy, I wanted to give him tea and some uh, donuts. So I had that in my backpack, nice and warm. And I was on my way out, out of Polish, going on the search and rescue. And I was following the beach, and I see lots of lights, and all the snow machine lights were all in different directions. They were, they were, weren't really uh, following, looking for tracks. They were getting more scattered, going too, a little bit too fast. And so I kept on going slow following the beach. So during my ride about half an hour later I never saw any any skidoo tracks or a uh, sign of the, his boy's uh, footprints. But that time he had mucklucks so on hard snow you can't see his tracks. So I kept on following it slowly and I ran into a bunch of rangers on our group they told me they didn't see any tracks or any... They saw the scooter tracks once in a while, but it was getting windy at night. The south, south wind started drifting, and it was getting more harder to find the trail on the scooter trail and where his boy dropped off. So I started going by myself. I got away from the group, and I knew... I knew if a little boy dropped, They'll probably be hiding behind the rocks, you know, um, in uh, from the wind. 
So I kept on going, following the beach, and I climbed up, and I was going, and I know that I knew where I was, and I started looking at those rocks. I, I shut the snow machine off, and I shut it off, and I started walking. I started calling uh, George's son figures, and he, I guess he couldn't, couldn't hear me, so I looked around walking, looking all through these big rocks, and I reached the last one, it was a bigger one. So I started calling his name, but I guess, I guess he couldn't hear me from the wind. It was drifting, south wind. So I walked towards it, and sure enough, he was there laying down. And I woke him up. I, said, I asked him if he's okay. He said he, um, he told me he was hiding from the grizzly bear. He saw one, he was hiding behind the rock. So I put him in my parka, gave him tea, and he said he was dry, so I gave him tea, and gave him a piece of donut, and I asked him, I'm going to bring you home now, figures. So I brought him home, and their parents were surprised that I found him. Yeah. And <coughs> and I'll never forget the, the day I found him. <coughs> yeah, he still remembers. So every time he every time he see me, he um, asks if I need <coughs> if I need anything, coffee or yeah. That's awesome. Yeah. Awesome. After I found him. The RCMP, they were, they, they both went and see me, and they were both crying, and a lot of the hunters were crying as we um, shook with each other and hugged everybody, and um, it's just something that you don't want to happen again, or you know what to do the next time. And um, I was taught not to get excited when you're out hunting, and there's always the next day, or you could, you know, you, the more excited you are, you start to lose control of your mind and get you off balance where you where you are. So I, I'm, I was very glad I was taught how to uh, survive out there on these uh, our conditions that we have so much winds and we, you don't know what's going to happen out there. So. I forgot to ask you, how uh, um, were the rangers anywhere near him or no? No, they were a little ways off, but um, you know, uh, I was lucky, and um, I know kids, I mean, uh, for his age, he'd probably hide behind a rock for sure, cause you to stay away from the wind. Yeah. And he told me he saw a grizzly and he was trying to not to uh, make it see him, so. About how far away from town was it? It might have been close to 15 or to 20 miles. But that time you're zigzagging and yeah. the road may take longer. Yeah. That was on the land from the west side from here, mm. and the ocean is right down below. And the ocean that time, it, it, the beach were frozen, but a little ways out there was open water, so yeah. it, everything would just start to, um, start to freeze up. Yeah. I'm gonna tell a story how I survived it might have been an 18 hour to 19 hour walk from, I guess it was from other side Brock River to Politic here. It was minus, minus 46 or 47. And I was, um, the skidoo, I think the crank, the crank case went 
And if it was the piston, I would have let it run on one and I would have made it home, but it it didn't happen that way at the time. So I left it and I just put the cover on the skidoo so in case it blows, I know where to find where it was. And so I started walking from Brock, on top of Brock River to home to Politech, following my skidoo trail. And during, it started getting dark, before it started getting dark, there was a red fox following me. So I was taught um, you can't sleep five minutes, otherwise you'll never wake up. So I, I was lucky I had a watch and I rest for every minute and a half. But it seems like it was a little longer, but and just when I was dozing off, the, fo the red fox started pulling on my uh, left mm -hmm. leg, trying to wake me up. It didn't chew on my ski pants or anything, my wolf mitts. So I got up and it started running on the trail. So I started on the trail. I knew it was there, so I kept following it. And during the 18 hour walk, I, it was really cold and you try to uh, keep your face away from the wind as much as possible. So during the night, I started getting closer and closer to home. <coughs> and <coughs> I just realized I had a newborn girl and <coughs> I wasn't going to give up. So I kept walking and soon enough, the red fox, I could see it towards the sh shadow and it turned away from me. So when I climbed up a little bank, I started to see the politic lights. So it was sort of guiding. They guide, they probably guide uh, people that are in distress or something like that. So I, so when I reach home, I started just about to reach home and when I look again, the fox turned away from me and went to its own business. So when I reached home, I knocked on the door and was, the wind was just picking up and all my, uh, the fur on my down parka was all frosted up from the eye, from the walking. And you don't want to, when you're walking on the ocean, you don't want to sweat too much. Otherwise your body starts getting cold right away. So I just mostly took my time on this uh, walk here, but um, I after I got home, I never woke up for about maybe two to three days, and that's probably how how much energy I had left, just enough to make it home. What do you think the fox had to do with? What was the fox doing? Well, when I first saw it. And it, it looked at me, so I kept on walking and I was wondering how come it's following me. Then it started to run, it ran ahead of me. Then it was probably, probably knew that I was going to somehow fall asleep or something. But I was very lucky that, that night and day on the, my journey back home. And it was a cold one when I reached home. I, the next day or so I asked, what was the wind chill? It was 40, might, might have been 47 to 48. And this is, this is my true story of what happened as, and um, I was very lucky to learn from my uncle and grandfather how to survive. And out in the ice, you, you don't want to sleep more than a minute and a half or so, otherwise you'll never wake up. I never did panic. I know when you start panicking, you're going to get more scared and your mind go to another place where you start to hallucinate. And I didn't want that to happen to me. I just 
kept my mind focused on trying to make it, make it to home. I was very lucky I had all my Down Park uh, feather pants and the boots, they were minus 70, so I was very warm and the Wolfmiths were very warm and the one I had, they are well insulated. My first word, words would have said, always carry enough gas Make sure you have flashlight or, you know, a, a knife in case something happens or you get your machine stuck or something. There's always good to have ropes and axe in case something happens, shovel. And also, um, try not, if you do break down, try not to leave your machines on the bank, otherwise You'll never find it during a blizzard. That way you know where your your machines are it's the next time you go and pick it up. I was a little stiff, but uh, maybe a couple of days later I went and picked up the machine. I uh, took the motor apart and the crankshaft went. Once the crankshaft goes, you have to take it right apart and either order a new set. I knew where it was. I didn't put it near a bank or anything. I put it right on top, facing towards the south wind, because the south wind over here is one of our most powerful winds. And if I fa you face your machine other way, you'll have the cabin or something will break off from the wind. Uh. The snow drifts I was, I was walking on, they were coming from the south. So when I was walking, before it gets dark, there's little leaves like the ones on the willow. And at the end of the leaf, it's always pointing towards the land. I was taught that when I was younger. And you follow that and it never miss your right towards the land. So you can't, you, you see those on the land or the ice and you, you follow that and you know, uh, you, it'll tell you the dir direction of the land because the land won't be that far away. So, thank you very much for having me tell the story.